Hello my dear friends, you are on the Military Summary channel and today we will discuss the situation in Ukraine on the 3rd of December. Today we have a lot of very interesting updates, so let's start. And today we are going to start with the Kupinsk frontline, Kupinsk Liman frontline. Uh, today during the previous 24 hours we got a lot of updates from this area, a lot of very interesting updates, so let's start. If you take a look at this map first, I believe that you won't see the changes or something like this. And uh, if we take a look at the Russian sources map, uh, as you can see, there are no updates on this front line at all. That oh, this map shows the same situation. Uh, the according to the report of Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation, the Ukrainians tried to attack in the direction of Kuzyomovka. If we're talking about Liman front line, the Ukrainians were trying to attack in the direction of Kolymychiha, this one, and in direction of Zhitlovka, this one. As a result of those attacks, the Ukrainians lost around 90 soldiers, something around 14 armored vehicles. All those attacks were repulsed, but and uh, as you can see, the story is uh, the same as we saw yesterday, the day before yesterday, maybe a month ago. So the, the Ukrainians are trying to attack along this front line, but all the, their attacks were repulsed by the Russians. But there is an important thing about the situation yesterday in the evening, very late in the evening, uh, maybe somewhere at 11 p.m. of local time, we got the first update from Liman front line, from Kriminaya front line, to be more precise. Uh, and the Russians noted a lot of Russian military experts, soldiers, officers from on the ground from this area reported that the, that day, the previous 24 hours, were pretty successful for the Ukrainians. And as a result of their attacks, of the Ukrainian attacks, they managed to penetrate the Russian defense orders and the Ukrainians managed to enter Chirvanapopovka this town. Uh, so the Russians reported that the Ukrainians managed to enter uh, to establish control over let's say western part or i don't know so some part that located close more close to the ukrainians were taken by the ukrainians as you can see the russians has been updated their map uh, like they have changed the front line and as you can see now the ukrainians tries to attack in direction of zhitlovka and this very close to krimina situation is very critical believe me and if we take a look at the western sources map we're going to see that uh, the West source map has been updated and according to this information entire Shirvanopopovka from now on is under Ukrainian control or at least is in the gray zone because the blue cloud uh, means that the Ukrainians got like real 100% control and everything that is between the red and the blue cloud like without color means that uh, now this area is in the gray zone so as you can see the entire Shirvanopopovka from now on is in the gray zone and the Russians reported that the Ukrainians managed to enter this town uh, from that moment we haven't received any updates about the russian progress or if they managed to uh, counter attack and return control over this area but anyway from now on uh, we understand that the road that connected Krimina, Rubizhnoya, Krimina, Privolia, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, agglomeration, all these towns, this road R66 that connected uh, this agglomeration with uh, Svatova is now uh, from now on is under real fire control and I believe that uh, this road is also under physical control. As you can see this situation happened and uh, the Ukrainians were very successful as soon as they moved their uh, 45th artillery brigade. I believe that now they have some progress, some power, um, well, at least some heavy power in their artillery and uh, that played a very big role in this offensive operation and now the we can say that this front line has been changed the configuration of this front line has been changed and we will discuss the new reality for the russians in this area this road r66 was and still very important for the russians and the main thing is that if we uh, take a look at this map and let's say we, we are going to say that there is let's say a severdonetsk agglomeration and let's say Svatov agglomeration, like town from Nizhnyi Duvanka to Krasnorechska. These two defense areas that the Russians try to defend. And the Russians from their side are uh, split this area in two parts. They're saying Liman front line. Liman front line for the Russians means the area between Liman and Krimina uh, in Severodonetsk agglomeration. And if the Russians are talking about Kupinsk front line, they're saying about 
the area uh, the Russians are uh, near Svatova. So this is two front lines. And the thing is that before uh, the Ukrainians established control over Chervana Popovka, these two front lines were connected by the road R66. And as you can see, the distance between, let's say, Kremlin and Krasnoyevsk is around 20 kilometers. If we calculate the road uh, like using uh, the roads, it's around 25 kilometers using the roads. So it's these towns were they were very close to each other and the Russians has nice possibilities to be mobile with the reserves, to move their forces between two towns, to have... So that was pretty successful and this configuration was pretty good for the Russians. But now the Ukrainians, I believe that they established uh, fire control or maybe some physical control over this road and uh, at least uh, maybe the Ukrainians were pushed back and the Russians uh, like returned control. For now there are no updates. But anyway, I believe that it's too dangerous to use this road for supply and support of Krasnodyevskaya or to have some communications between these two front lines. And if we try to analyze and understand where is the, the uh, let's say, where is the another way how to do this, how the Russians can move their forces if it, po if it necessary from Crimea or Privolia or Bizhna to uh, Svatova or Krasnodyevskaya and we, as we can see according to this map, there is no more roads that connect these two towns and the only one way and the only way how to do this is to make us this small hook and just with help of this like the distance between these two areas was around 20 kilometers and now the distance between these two areas is around 60 kilometers and the most important one that there is just one cross this cross that the russians have to move their forces from uh severodonetsk uh, agglomeration to uh let's say Svatovo front line and now the uh, the nice the western countries understand that this cross plays significant role in this operation the only the only thing they need to do for the ukrainian is to establish some control uh, uh, over this area. Of course, the distance is very big, but uh, they have high mercy for these purposes. And if the, uh, the Western countries in Ukraine are able to establish fire control over this cross, of course, the Russians will have more problems than they have right now. Now, these days, a um, very important role uh, plays a town by the name of Starobilsk. Because from now on, uh, the Russians need to have their logistics through this town. If um, before uh, that happened, uh, the Ukraine established control over the road, the Russians could stretch their warehouses along this line and to be flexible and mobile. Now the Russians need to have their like uh, strategic reserves, strategic um, shell, armor shell in this town. And from this town, they, now they need to supply this area and this area as well. So they, now their logistic... Uh, the possibilities and capability of the Russian logistics has been reduced by taking um, by the fact that the Ukrainians got control over the road R66. A lot of sources before uh, were projected this situation that the Ukrainians will try to encircle, but uh, from this perspective, I don't agree with this because it's highly, highly unlikely that the Ukrainians will try to attack in these directions. Uh, the same, uh, the reason is the same. There are no roads in this area. Anyway, if the Ukrainians want to attack, they need to stick to the road road to the main arteria why the Ukrainians attacks in the direction of Svatov because if they take control of Svatov they open uh, the road the door to this road uh, M26 that connects Svatov and Starobelsk and if Ukrainians continue de uh, developing their offensive operation in this area they will be able to attack the towns along this road and to take them so this is much more easy than to attack using the fields and so on so this is the reason why the ukrainians won't attack uh, or encircle um let's say lisichansk uh severodinsk agglomeration if they want to do this anyway they need to attack from svatov in direction of starobilsk and then from starobilsk in direction of novaidar so if the ukrainians want to encircle lisichansk agglomeration the only way to do this is to take svatov starobilsk novaidar so along the road anyway along the road I don't believe that Ukrainians will try to do this along fields and rivers and so on. If we are talking about Svatova, Svatova is still in the Russian control. Uh, there are still heavy clashes around the same towns, uh, as we discussed in, before, near Klemychikha and near Novoselska Kuzumovka. The Russians still there. Furthermore, as you can see, the Russians control control over Novoselska. But uh, because of the fact that the Russians lost Chervana Popovka or the situation is critical there, I'm not sure that uh, 
Russians are able to hold these towns as well and maybe they will be forced to step back because sooner or later these towns will be reduced to the ruins and there would be there would be no places even to hide or to have their position so it's like from logical perspective they will be forced to step back um, towards a more reliable position or at least towards a town that still exists and where the Russians are able to have their fire position, the position where they can hide their forces and so on, their um, armored vehicles and so on. So we can say that uh, the Ukrainians have activated their movements on the LPR front line and these days we are going to see uh, the beginning or continue of their offensive operation in direction of Starobelsk uh, through Svatova, Krimina, uh, I'm not sure that the Ukrainians will try to take control or storm Krimina, but anyway, everything is possible these days. Uh, so we'll see and follow. Let's follow this situation. If we are talking about uh, front line between Belogorovka, Seversk, and Bakhmut, uh, the Russians reported that Ukrainians made uh, a lot of attempts of their counteroffensive operation. They were trying to return control over Kurdyumovka, over Andreevka. So they made counteroffensive operation. Uh, more reserves. The Ukrainians sent more reserves to this area. They let's say, and now they have some. Uh, f not not free, but at least some forces to use, and they did make these counteroffensive operations. Uh, all those attacks, according to the Russians, were repulsed. Uh, the Russians always said that all the attacks were repulsed, but then they're losing some time sometimes. And as a result of those attacks, the Ukrainians lost around sixty soldiers and around seven soldiers, uh, seven armored vehicles. Anyway, we can say um, that Kurdyumovka, Azarianovka, Mayorsk, Andreevka are still under the Russians. There are very heavy clashes in Oputne. Uh, today, during the day, we got some updates that Ukrainians made a decision to leave Bakhmut, but it's not true. There are still heavy clashes. The Ukrainians are not planning to give up and to step back. The Russians are not planning to do the same as well. Uh, we Now we are like the witnesses of the final battle of this year. I'm not sure that the battle for Bakhmut is going to be completed by the end of this year. I believe that yeah, if the Russians are able to take control, maybe somewhere in January they will be able to do If Of course, if nothing extraordinary happens, uh, but the battle is going to take up to two or maybe three months uh, before this ter territory will be completely taken by the Russians. If we are talking about uh, Donetsk frontline, as you can see, uh, Donetsk is under heavy fire. As we discussed yesterday, the Ukrainians moved more artillery to this sector and uh, to tell the truth, the intensity um, uh, of uh, shelling of Donetsk has been increased since that moment. Uh, today we got more and more pictures of killed civilians in this town. A lot of losses among civilians, so the situation is not good. But if we're talking about the Ukrainians, they managed to move some reserve to this front line, and the Ukrainians tried made another a few attempts by by attacking the Russians on the Donetsk uh, ring road. This is some kind of big road and there are a lot of bridges along the road and uh, there are a lot of fortification uh, fortifications under the bridges. And uh, this map is not updated, but the according to the last Russian report we have, uh, the entire road is under Russian control. Maybe just the only pl the, there is one place that's still under Ukrainians. These small fortifications between um, Oputna and Spartak uh, and the mineral and about the, between these areas and uh, the Ukrainians were trying to attack from Avdiivka. They were trying to return control over Vadiane, uh, but all those attacks were repulsed, and the uh, the Ukrainians lost around six soldiers and some around seven armored vehicles. There are heavy clashes in the south front, south Donetsk front line. Uh, the are very heavy clashes in Marinka. Uh, the Russians got control over some re residential area in the south and the, over this fortification area. The Ukrainians made few counteroffensive operations in this area, but all their attack were repulsed. The same situation is around Uglidar. Uh, the Ukrainians were attacking the direction of Salotka. Novomayorsk, Shevchenko, um, all those attacks were repulsed and the Ukrainian lost around 40 soldiers, something around 7 armored vehicles. So the front line has been activated, as you can see. And uh, I believe that during the day you saw a lot of reports about the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Today the head of IAA organization reported that he had conversation with the Russians and with the Ukrainians. And uh, today he gave us some draft about the upcoming 
uh, great deal, big deal between the Russians and the Ukrainians. And as a result, as a goal of those, main goal of those negotiations is that uh, Zaporozhye power plant should be demilitarized area. Uh, the uh, but the thing is, the main thing is that um, I could I read those uh, those notes, those articles about uh, this agreement, and I, I as I understood as I understood um, according to this agreement, only the heavy, only armored vehicles and heavy vehicles will be moved from this power plant. Uh, as I, I understand, the Russians um, uh, will be allowed to keep their some police forces, militia, militia forces, so light infantry, we can say, without tanks, without armored vehicles, without artillery. In this case, the Ukrainians won't attack this area and the Russians as well won't attack Ukrainians from the territory of the power plant. And uh, I believe that there is another important uh, agreement that um, who is going to control this power plant and will this power plant supply Ukraine with electricity. So these three main points. But anyway, uh, I believe that by the end of this year, I believe that we're going to see the implementation of this deal. As we discussed many times in the past about the big deal between Ukraine and Russian Federation, about Kherson, about power plant, uh, the Russians understand that they don't want to uh, return control of this power plant because of the question of the dirty bomb but i believe they agree to move their uh, heavy vehicles heavy tanks from this area uh, on the safe distance but they will keep the militia forces light infantry and the only thing the russians need is to have guarantees from ukraine that they won't do any attempts of crossing Dnipro and taking over this uh, power plant uh, like like a part of breaking deal because in this case, it will be very difficult for the Russians to return control over this power plant. And who is going to control if EIA organization this one situation, if Ukrainians this is another situation. So for now, a lot of uh, there are, there is a fog of war, and but I believe that uh, by the end of this year, this situation will be resolved. And as far as I understand, if we are talking about Kherson area, uh, the Russians uh, return control over this area and. Uh, uh, this is what Ukrainians got from this deal and the Russians got all their uh, ports and their grain and a lot of uh, things that they produce were unblocked and the Russians were allowed to trade with these goods. And if we're talking about Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, if the Russians return control and start supplying and support to Ukraine with electricity, they will be um, allowed to... Uh, transport gas and oil through Ukraine in direction of Europe without to, to, to make like to they will have stable transition transit through Ukraine without any problems. Uh, but we know that there are a lot of problems with the price for oil and uh, but it's not concerned the oil uh, that moves along the pipelines just to, uh, according to the sea trade. So a lot of questions, a lot of question. Everybody wants to, uh, of course, to to get as much as possible from these deals so we'll see but anyway before the new year comes we're going to see a lot of very interesting updates at least on the Svatova front line i believe that ukrainians will continue developing their situation we will got if we're talking about bakhmut konstantin with these front lines i'm not sure that the next two weeks we're going to see a lot of updates because the next two weeks is going to be a process of the let's say, reducing of enemy's armies. Both sides will try to reduce without any progress on the ground. And maybe by the end of this year, we're going to see a lot of some progress in Marinka because the Russians says that they got a lot of success, a lot of progress. The Ukrainians have already lost Marinka and the only thing that Ukrainians do is just their winning time uh, and they're losing their soldiers. And of course, they try to reduce the Russian soldiers as well. But they have lost the battle for Marinka. This is just a question of time, but not the question of the town and control over this town. So this is the, that the Russians says about this situation and that's it for today military summer channel reminds you condemn any violence in ukraine thank you for watching subscribe to my channel put your likes join my patreon and have a good day bye bye